If you take your Bible and we'll turn with me, and also if you take your bulletin, that will help you as we look into God's Word. We are in Ephesians, we are going through the book of Ephesians, we're in Ephesians chapter 4. Lots of account temp people are out there, lots of people looking for jobs. What do they put on their resumes? Hmm, interesting information on job resumes. As one wrote, note, keep this resume on top of the stack, put all the others to use to heat your home. My typing speed is 756 words per minute. Whoa, even I know that, okay. Uh, I have an excellent memory, strong math skills, excellent memory, effective management skills, very good at math. Okay, I speak Russian, Italian, and Dutch like a kindergartner. <laughs> All right, you wanna put these down, so. Nonsense or not, some of us feel that our lives are like that. Lots of so-called ability, lots of high-speed stress, but not going anywhere. And whether we are school children struggling with mathematics or workers wrestling with a meaning, meaningly, meaningful or meaningless job, we all seem that we are looking for more the aspect of purpose. Without purpose, nothing is really worth doing. Do I have a reason? And if our lives are going to have meaning, we must live for the Christ who has given us a new life. Almost like that cross bearer that we saw, our identity and our actions go together. And what we do is integral in terms of the part of who we are. And it is really evident even from day one or even when we were young as children. Like the story of four-year-old Johnny who falls down on the sidewalk as he runs to greet his father who has just pulled into the driveway. Johnny's sort of tired, he's sort of hungry because he's still upset with his two-year-old sister that took his favorite toy. And because of all this, when he runs to his father and he's crying, and he's really crying a little bit more than was warranted, his dad sort of picks him up and said, there you are, you're a big boy, Johnny. Act like it. In other words, who's Johnny? He's a big boy. You should act like a big boy. It's like the princess who sits beside her mother, the queen, at the princess's presentation to the public as she is now heir apparent to the throne. And when it's time for the princess to stand up and walk to the microphone and to say a few words to those gathered dignitaries that are there, the queen leans over to her and whispers to her, you are a princess. Walk like one. In other words, who is she? She is a princess. And that understanding should affect how she acts. 18-year-old Chuck has gone through five tough weeks of the Marine Corps down in South Carolina. During the last week, the recruits are forced to crawl under rolls of bob wire. Well, there's machine gun fire, live fire going on inches above. Chuck is climbing through this all and he freezes. He begins to sweat. His hands dig into the clay and his panic begins to sweep over his mind and then uh, another buddy sort of crawls up next to him and said, get a hold of yourself, man. You're a Marine. Act like it. Who's Chuck? Chuck is a Marine and that should affect how he acts. Throughout our life from beginning to end, our actions are linked to our identity. Who are you? How we see ourselves affects how we then act in our world. This is the basic principle that Paul is going to give to us here in the opening chapter of chapter 4 of Ephesians. He writes in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In essence, he says, you're a child of God, act like it. One of the greatest difficulties in the Christian walk arises because we never really understand or never really believe who the Bible says we are. The Bible says we're children of God. But because, but because uh, we see ourselves as children of the world, and too often we do, that we don't act like it. And we act more like the world. Paul has told us, he has said that you have been chosen by God to be holy and blameless. 
We see that in chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 5, he says you've been adopted into the family. And the third thing is in verse 7 of chapter 1, he says that your sins are forgiven. The sins from the past, the things from the present, and even the sins of the future. They've all been forgiven under Christ. We have been redeemed, he says in verse 7. We have been given a fabulous inheritance, he says in verse 14, that we will experience in eternity. In verse 13, he says, you have been sealed, you have been secured by the Holy Spirit. We have been made alive in Christ, he says in chapter 2, verse 6. We have been made fellow citizens with the saints of God in chapter 2, verse 19. We have been made, been made into a dwelling place in which God resides, chapter 2, verse 22. In other words, because we are created in the image of God, we have an infinite inherent value. And if we see ourselves as God sees us, it will exalt us without inflating us. And it will humble us without debasing us. In other words, we are children of God. We are destined for the throne. And now Paul basically is saying, act like it. Now, you may be thinking, I want to believe all this, but I'm having trouble. I don't feel like I have infinite worth. How could I look at the things that I've done? And a lot of you will say, well, you don't know all the stuff that I've done in my life. You don't know all the bad things that have happened. You don't know all the faults and all the def deficiencies that I have. How could God love me? But he can, and he does. Let me, uh, let me give you an analogy. Suppose you inherited a gold mine. You're overjoyed. You, you love the gold mine. You can hardly wait to get out to the gold mine. You can hardly wait to go to work in the gold mine. But the first time you go to the gold mine, it's almost like you walk through it to see your treasure. And it's like the gold that's laying there. It's almost like it becomes animate and begins to talk and says, the gold says, how can you love me? I'm all dirty. I'm all mixed up with all this awful iron ore and I have rotten clay all over me and I'm contaminated with bauxite and all these other mineral deposits. I'm ugly. I'm worthless. But you say to the gold, oh, but I do love you. Because you see, I do understand what you are really are. And I know all of those imperfections, but I have a plan for you. I'm not going to leave you that way. I'm going to purify you. No, I'm going to get rid of all that other stuff. I see that you have inherent worth and you have value within you. And I know that all that iron ore and that clay and those mineral deposits are not a part of your true identity. You are just temporarily mixed up with them. But I'll warn you, it will be not easy because you'll have to go through some heat and through some pressure. But then look at this piece of gold. Look at this gold jewelry, because that's what you are. Left to yourself, you'll remain in this dark place, buried in a dirty ore. But I know that you can change, and I know what you need to do that. And I believe that with that, I can make you beautiful, and you can make me wealthy. God is not blind. He knows all about your imperfections. But he also understands that you have inherent worth and value. And he knows how to change us from what we were to what he can do with us now. Much of our failure is to trust, is to believe, to obey. It stems from the fact that we do not see ourselves, we don't look at we don't see ourselves the way God sees us. We do not understand uh, who we have become in Christ. If we are believers and followers of him, we are different. And this is what Paul is trying to tell the Ephesians. He has spent three chapters here, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the first three chapters that we have looked at. Now he begins to say, that's what you are in Christ. And he says, those first three chapters are telling you this. Now the next three chapters are going to tell you how to live that way. I remember when I was a child, I'd uh, get ready to go to camp. And my mother would uh, sit me down and tell me to remember who I am while I was away. I never, I never quite sure understood what she meant, except that I was the preacher's kid. You guys know, well, you guys have met preacher's kids. They've all been good. And uh, 
basically my mom said you better behave and uh, she gave me the talk I didn't she gave my brother the same talk you know. but uh, you know I think that uh, she probably has something in mind of what Paul's talking about here that I need to walk worthy of the calling that Christ has given to me now in chapter 4 the Apostle Paul begins to write about this kind of behavior the book of Ephesians is basically you can break it in half First three chapters are basically doctrine. Chapters four through six are duty. In other words, duty is obviously the response to doctrine. That's why Paul has been careful to delineate all of the basic doctrines. And then in chapter four, he begins to teach the characteristics of what the Christian life is about. In other words, we are to transfer from the doctrine that we learned in the first three chapters to now duty as to how to live that. This is a basic concept of the New Testament. And perhaps the best explanation of this concept is found in the phrase that Paul, when he writes to Titus, he says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. In other words, what, what, what Paul is saying is that as believers, we are to be the adornments on the Christmas tree. In other words, we are to adorn what God has done for us. And that is the demonstration that we, as we live that out for the Lord. We are supposed to live with certain ways and certain conduct, and a godly life brings light before the various facets of God. In other words, we, look, we are the demonstration of how God changed somebody's life. He changed us by his grace and by his love, and we are now the demonstration of that, the aspect of that light shining through us. Suppose, for example, you try to explain to an unbeliever the truth about God. He's not so sure. You know, maybe he looks at your life and he says, well, I don't know. But then he looks at somebody that's a really godly person in his mind. He sees not only sort of the intellectual aspect, but he sees the truth of the way this person lives. They're attractive. They're appealing because he sees the life of God in action. That's how a Christian is to do, is to walk worthy and to adorn the doctrine of what Christ has told us. And he is to walk in the eyes of the world so that they can see. There was a uh, documentary by PBS. The name of it was called Carrier. And it was a fascinating look of life on board the USS Nimitz, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier that, that uh, basically is the name of an entire class of ships now. More than 5,000 sailors and Marines uh, live on this floating armed city that the president can basically dispatch to to extend the military might of the U.S. anywhere in the world that it might be needed. Uh, an aircraft carrier is a mobile four acres expression of the United States sovereignty in the global matrix of power and diplomacy. Though the crew that serves on the Nimitz may perform different jobs, they all work toward one purpose. Their one purpose is to maintain and launch aircraft that can deliver ordnance to demolish a target wherever the president says. In other words, food service personnel, pilots, machinists, all are there to make sure that the Nimitz does its job in any circumstance around the world. But... Every day, the crews from various departments abandon their usual assignments and they leave their typical jobs and tasks to participate in a curious ritual on board called FOD. FOD is an acronym for Foreign Object Damage. It is anathema to the 85 aircraft that are aboard the Nimitz. It is basically called a FOD walk. And the crews walk every inch of the deck in three or four lines across the deck that stretch from one side to the other. And with their heads down, their eyes focused on the deck beneath them, they painstakingly search for anything, an errant screw, a shred of metal, because they know that even a tiny sliver of metal can damage and ruin a million dollar aircraft. And they make this painfully aware if there was carelessness and what it can do is much more than a sophisticated enemy weapon because carelessness can make the Nimitz and its flight deck out of commission. Paul is saying that we must vigilantly keep watch on the little things in our lives so that we can be an adornment and make attractive to others our walk with God. 
Chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. You know, it's interesting. Why does Paul say he's a prisoner? Because he just mentioned it beginning of chapter 3. And I think what he does here is he brings it up again to make the point that no matter what it costs, walk worthy. And basically Paul is saying, look at me. I'm in jail for trying to follow the Lord. I'm a prisoner. In other words, that's about as bad a human circumstance as you can have. But I'm telling you, in spite of what has happened to me, you walk worthy of the one who called you. In other words, let your life match your character. And the word worthy here in the Greek has to do with equalizing the scales. As a Christian, your life is patterned, uh, ought to be equalized with your identity. In other words, the way that you say you are, you know, we walk the talk. There ought to be a perfect harmony between who you are and how you live. I urge you, he says here in the verse. The, the word urge here in the Greek means to call someone with an intensity. It's the idea of pleading with someone. Paul says, I beg you, walk worthy. And the reason that Paul didn't hesitate to beg people to walk worthy was because he was so concerned about them. And, in other words, that's where his passion is. He, Paul, Paul writes in Colossians 1, we preach warning every man, teaching every man, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. In Galatians, my little children whom I travail in birth, I have, and, uh, I have birth pains about you until Christ be formed in you. See, that's what Paul's great desire. In fact, the goal of the ministry is the perfecting of the saints. So when you see Paul say, I urge you to walk worthy, you're seeing the very nerve center of his own life. He was so committed to this that he went day and night continually weeping and praying that they might sense that reality. The yearning, the yearning of a pastor's heart. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, God said, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you keep these commandments and obey my truth, I will bless you. It's interesting, in other words, the blessing was conditioned on obedience. But in the New Testament, God says, I've already blessed you. I've blessed you with all the spiritual blessings that you see in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, in light of all those blessings, will you obey me? This is the difference between law and grace. The Old Testament says, if you obey, I'll bless. New Testament says, I've already blessed you. Now, will you please obey? So we respond to God not out of fear, but out of gratitude. We respond not to the, we don't respond to the thundering, crashing lightning of Mount Sinai. We respond to the wonderful grace and love of Mount Calvary as we see a Savior on a cross. So Paul says, I'll give you three chapters of God's blessing. One, two, and three. Now chapter four begins, and he says, now walk worthy. There's a military chaplain, and he writes this. I had been invited to speak at a nearby Air Force station in the absence of their, uh, their uh, vacationing chaplain. So I arrived there in the Bay Area on the BART. The BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System. I got off the train, and there I met a very sharp-looking young airman in uniform. We introduced ourselves to one another. He told me his name was Ronald. He offered to take my briefcase, and I said, that's fine. And we began now heading for his car as he would take me. We had hardly taken a dozen steps when he turned aside to help a woman reload her baggage, which had slipped off the two-wheel cart. She went, and he went over and helped. We headed out again, only to have him pause in time just for a small child that was wanting to get a drink from the drinking fountain, and he lifted this small child up. He told the little fellow so long in a very cheery voice that could be heard 50 yards away. Off we went again. As we came through the exit doors, he stopped to hold the door open for a man who was carrying two large shopping bags and was struggling along. I was beginning to feel like the priest who passed by on the other side in the story of watching the great and the good Samaritan. As we walked across the street, we approached a young woman who was standing on the curb. As we got closer, he said, can I help you, ma'am? And she quietly said, do you know how to get to Oakland from here? 
He went over to the brochure rack and pulled the one out, took it over to her, and he described in very intricate detail how to ride the BART and how to get to her destination. Ever since he had met me at the gate, in some ways he had this sort of goofy grin on his face. I don't mean goofy in a critical way. It seemed to me that he was always happy. And he was happy with everyone around him. As we headed out of the parking lot, we stopped to pay the parking fee, and he said uh, to the attendant, how you doing today? The guy said, sort of grumpily, fine. Man, I bet this is a great job, as the guy's giving him his change back. All day long, you get to sit out here in the sunshine, enjoy the beauty of the water and the nice weather. I bet you never get tired of watching the birds out here and the, and the ships that are passing by. The guy didn't say anything. Finally, we got to the freeway and headed for San Jose and to, my, to the base, and I asked him, I asked him, how did you learn to do that? And his response was, I mean, like what? And I said something about, you know, this being nice and helping other people. And he, and he, said, he said it like this. Oh, that. Well, of course, I'm a Christian. Like, you know, what's wrong with you? I'm, you know. And, uh, you know, there was like, like, why would you even ask me that question? But he did go on. He said, during the Gulf War, I served on a detachment that cleared minefields. I had two close friends that were wounded. I saw two Saudi soldiers blown to pieces right before my eyes. I never knew if maybe my next second or my next step would be my last. And so I just developed an attitude that since my next step might be my last, I would just try to get everything out of this one. And so I learned to enjoy every moment, every step, to walk like Jesus. You know, only one thing matters from the moment that you become a Christian to the moment that you see Jesus, that you walk worthy. The only thing that matters is that you live unto who you are. It doesn't matter that you make money or dress nice or have a nice house or have a nice car or get promotions. It doesn't matter that you buy that little extra thing that you've always wanted and needed. It doesn't matter whether you're education or whether you're a professional or how many honors you've ever gotten. The only thing that matters is that you walk worthy. It doesn't matter if you miss the big game this afternoon or miss the television program or miss the little trip that you wanted to take to that other place. It only matters that you walk worthy. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter how you try to serve the Lord in the flesh. It only matters that you walk worthy. That's the sum of it all. Or as my grandfather used to tell us, Two words, live it, live it, live it out. Let me close with this. Back in 2002, the Iowa State Buckeyes played for the national championship. The coach, his name was Jim Trussell, delivered a speech to his players before the game. Like a lot of coaches have done that. A lot of coaches are going to probably be doing that today. The coach reviewed for his players the great history and tradition of Ohio State University football. He talked about the legendary coach, Woody Hayes. He talked about the ivy-colored walls. He talked about the fantastic marching band and their famous scripted Ohio and the dotted I that's done by a bass player. And at the end, he told them, I want you to go out there tonight and play in such a way that when you come back to this university in the future, or gather for a reunion 50 years from now, that you'll look back on this night and say, that was the greatest night of my life. That coach wanted his players to play worthy of the great university, and which they did. And that's exactly what Paul is telling us. Live that way. In your bulletin, or you receive something that came to you, there's a little strip of paper. I'm going to ask you to just find that. And uh, it would be interesting. Would it be interesting if when you became a Christian, the Lord instantly stamped on your forehead? And by the way, I'm not asking you to take this piece of paper and put it on your forehead. But would it be interesting if he just stamped it and said, watch me, I follow Christ. Or I'm a child of God. 
What would that do to your lifestyle? If I knew that everybody knew I was a Christian, would my life be different? I want to encourage you to take this piece of paper, take the sticker off, and put it somewhere. I don't care where. Uh, maybe it's on the mirror of your car. Um, maybe to put it as a place to remind yourself. Watch me. I follow Christ. If we wear the name of Jesus Christ, don't you think we should walk worthy of it? If we bear all the blessings of the Savior, don't you think we ought to live up to it? To him who said in the Old Testament, you obey me and I'll bless you, how much more should we obey? And then say, I've been blessed. Let me follow you. My prayer is the same as Paul's. I beg you, walk worthy. Let's bow together in prayer. We are thankful, our wonderful God, for your kindness and your grace that has been shown to us and demonstrated to us through the power of the cross. And we are thankful for the privilege that we have to know you because of that. We see as these first three chapters tell us all the wonderful things that you have given us and done for us. In light of that, may we now show our duty to the doctrine that has been done. We want to do it as an adornment to you. We want to do this as a demonstration to show what God has done. And we will thank you, and we will give you praise because of what Jesus has done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.